Curtis Tucker. Ken Hunnell, can you hear me? I can. Awesome. How yeah. are you? I'm great. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Glad to uh, connect with you this afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad we were able to work it out. We're a couple of busy guys. It's kind of kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. I'm doing something a little weird right now, doing a, doing a test. So I knew I was going to be talking to you on my phone, recording audio on Anchor, because you let me know that now you can record interviews on Anchor. And then all of a sudden I thought, you know what, what am I going to do about my vlog on YouTube? How am I going to, I can't record the video which, which is, is what, what I usually do when I do that Buzz Guy podcast. So I thought, what I'm going to do. So what I did was I hopped on and set up a Zoom account real quick. And I got on Zoom and I've got a one person Zoom recording going. So Zoom is recording me from my computer for the video. And then the Anchor app is recording us on audio. Nice, man. So you're. <laughs> and you said quickly. I know that wouldn't happen at, <laughs> on my end of all that technological logical, uh, fun. It wouldn't have happened quickly. <laughs> well, I, I only had minutes. I thought, what am I going to do? So anyway, we'll see. This should be interesting. So what's going to happen is the uh, YouTube video, uh, hopefully the audio will match out because basically what I'll have to do is mute the audio from the Zoom and just go with the audio from the anchor. And I know from doing that with other things, sometimes the audio doesn't match up exactly. But anyway, uh, we'll give it a try. So uh, so if you guys are out there listening to this interview right now on That Buzz Guy Podcast, and the video looks a little wonky, kind of dark and, and not as high quality, it's because I did record this with my, um, I guess this is a iMac. And so next time, though, I'm going to hook up my extra iPhone, which has no battery power at the moment. I'll, I'll hook that up and then I'll use that. But anyway, great to have you on that Buzz Guy podcast and uh, been meaning to get you on here and talk to you for a while. So how are things going today? They're going great. And thanks for having me on, man. I, I For your uh, listeners, I've been uh, kind of stalking Curtis a little bit for a few months, just trying to get to know him and, and uh, follow on the podcast. So I'm very honored to be on here with you, Curtis. Well, I appreciate that. And so I've gotten really, you know, as you said, we both have gotten really busy, but I've noticed that after listening to my podcast, you have started your own podcast. And I noticed you're continuing to do new ep new episodes, whereas I uh, have kind of faltered after my uh, car collision and trying to get one of my kids into OU and this and that. Um, I've gotten a little behind. So this is going to be the first episode in a little while. But um, so what I want to do is kind of talk to people on this podcast, kind of about um, being an entrepreneur, being a business owner, and then how how business owners are standing out from their competition. So what I'd like to first start out with is is kind of kind of get your background as being a kid all the way through high school. Did you have any entrepreneur tendencies or did you ever kind of envision yourself? Uh, I probably should introduce you. I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and your business. Um, but did you ever kind of envision yourself as being a business owner back in the day? Yeah. So I, I've, I've thought a lot about it. First of all, my name is Ken Hunnell. I own Enid Auto Body uh, here in Enid, Oklahoma, which is, like I said, how I kind of started stalking Curtis a little bit and looking at Facebook and, and just all the followers and things that he had uh that you have i guess but um but when i was growing up i remember uh man i loved hot wheels and i remember having the little hot wheels set up where i would lay them out and i would have some that i was fixing and doing different things on and i remember even uh my first job so when i was a kid i i didn't really i didn't know what i wanted to do necessarily but i knew everything i what i wanted to do um, but or I, that didn't make sense. What I, what I did do, I, I got into. So like in high school, I hauled hay, um, and, and drove farm equipment and boots. And, and I loved that. I was proud of that. So I guess whatever job and different things I had, I was proud of. And I, I kind of got all the way into, I just started to realize that there were certain things that would only take me so far. Uh, but I do remember, um, and I, I've been trying to figure out the exact timeline, but I do remember having Hot Wheels and laying them out. And then my first real job that wasn't um, 
hauling hay and working for, uh, uh, you know, a big hay operation was uh, I worked at a dealership uh, as a lot attendant, as a service attendant. So a driver, basically drive cars and take out trash and different stuff like that. But I remember even being 20 years old, laying out these Hot Wheels and and designing my own dealership. Um, and not that I ever, I guess I never, at that time, I didn't, I certainly didn't feel like I'd ever have the means to have my own dealership, but maybe I thought I would have a repair shop. I, I don't, I, I don't know why I was so fascinated with that other than that's what I did at the time. Um, ironically, I kind of just fell into the body shop industry. I, um, after high school, I worked at a dealership in Wichita, Kansas for a few years and kind of moved my way up from the driver to being a mechanic and quickly realized that a mechanic really wasn't my, um, I'm decent at changing parts, but I wasn't real good at uh, diagnosing, figuring out, solving the problem. Tell me what's wrong. I'll put the parts on, but figuring out the problem, which is really important for a mechanic, <laughs> was not a strength. Um, so then I went to WSU, Wichita State University, for a semester and kind of realized that that was going to take too long to try to get a degree. I guess I just didn't feel like I could stay focused that long. Uh, so then I worked on train cars, uh, tank cars for uh, five years outside year round, um, in the, uh, in the heat, in the cold, the snow, ice, rain, whatever, it didn't matter. Uh, one thing I always remember about that job is we used to have these sulfur cars that we had to, um, sulfur is very corrosive and we'd have to, they'd have to check the thickness every so often. Oh, wow. Yeah. And be, and so in order to do that, you have to get the sulfur out. Well, sulfur, the way that they, uh, get sulfur out of these tank cars is they steam uh, they use steam around the outside of it and it heats it up so then it becomes a liquid and it drains out the bottom well there's a crust that's <laughs> left in the bottom yeah those <laughs> those tank cars are about I don't know like 80 foot long I think roughly is how long these tank cars are but you have to um, go in there uh, in a Tyvek suit and a respirator and take this big gigantic air powered chisel and chisel all along the bottom of that car with a brass tip. Um, and the chisel tip on that, on that great big chisel was about three inches wide and you wow. have to chisel the whole length of that thing and clean it up. And, and then you sweep it all out and then you have to grind all these spots so they could check the thickness and that it was hot. It didn't matter if it was winter or summer, it was hot inside those tanks in that plastic suit. And then the worst part was you'd smell like a fart for about oh, a week yeah. because you just had that sulfur smell just oh. getting into your pores and stuff. So anyway, I did that for five years, really kind of realized that the, um, the supervisors and where I thought I might be able to advance to weren't, didn't necessarily live the lifestyle that I wanted to live. So started looking for something else. A friend of mine got me a job at a body shop and then it just fit. I started doing parts. It just fit, kind of made sense. And then um, that's when I realized that I, I felt that's when I really had that entrepreneurial mindset of, I think I could do this. I can see the opportunity, um, but it still took me, um, well, almost 20 years before I finally just had the, had the right partnership. My wife is very amazing and supportive and, and then uh, lots of prayer before I really felt like Enid was where I needed to be and, and uh, very thankful that all those things lined up to purchase this shop uh, at the December 30th of 2019. So basically January 1st, uh, been operating this shop. And uh, that's, that's my story of kind of how I got to Enid. Uh, but I, I always just kind of whatever I did, whether it was hauling hay or um, working as a mechanic. I remember mechanic, man, being proud of that I still remember to this day a red button up mechanic shirt that had my name so a patch on one side of the dealership name and my name on the other and being so proud of having that shirt so I guess just whatever I did I was proud of it and then finally just fell into the right industry to, that I could have an opportunity to have my own business yeah well very cool I mean you kind of sound like me I uh, high school and college I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do but whatever I was doing I felt like I was working hard uh, trying to be the best at what I was doing, but always kind of thinking in my mind that there's something, there's something next, there's something next, there's 
you know, I didn't ever feel like I was at a job where, oh, I, I just love this job and I'm, I know I'm going to do this for 50 years and retire, never do anything else. Um, yep. Just I kind of always felt like there was there was something out there. So um, I think you were kind of like me. We've talked, you know, you and I have kind of become friends and we've talked uh, quite a bit. Um, so when I was growing up, being uh, a child of a single mom who had to work two jobs, uh, not really at the time, any family members of mine owning a business or or really being into that realm. So I didn't really understand or even I probably had never even heard of the word entrepreneur or motivation or or any of this stuff. And it kind of sounds like you you kind of found some some books or or stuff that kind of helped teach you what an entrepreneur was or, or get motivated and do stuff. Tell us a little bit about when when you kind of discovered that and what that did for you. Yeah, awesome. So I was uh, managing a shop, um, a, a, a shop in Wichita, Kansas, and someone had approached me about recruiting me to a multi-level marketing company uh, called Primerica. And oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was, I, I was just like, well, and I, at the time I was single and it just seemed like something I could do of an evening and kind of, and taking a look at it. And then through that, they were all about self-improvement, all about uh, just a different way of thinking. And I had never even, it never even crossed my mind up until then that there were books or CDs or people that I could talk to, to help me uh, I, I guess I was just stubborn or, or thought I had it figured out that I just, you just do it. And then once, once I got into that, the, the book that probably impacted me the most uh, very early on was John Maxwell's The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And it just, it just resonated with me. It was probably the first book I ever read. I don't even know if I, I think I read one book my entire life up to that point. <laughs> and, and I remember, you know, I would uh, cliff notes versions of book reports and different things like that. I just kind of got by a bare minimum was enough for school. But, but uh, that man, that just opened up a whole new world to where I kind of, instead of listening to radio or music, I just always wanted to, they, they really drilled into your head, uh, uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? So what you oh, put yeah. in your head is going to help you how you process things. And, and so I just got turned on to it a hundred percent. And so they had discs of their leaders that you could listen to. And I looked at every, from then on, every time I was in the car as classroom time, which works pretty well now because I get a two hour drive uh, a few days a week. Uh, so I get some good classroom time. I get to listen to that buzz guy podcast and learn, uh, learn all the things that you've taught me thus far on there. And so that was really it. Uh, and then from then it just became this, you know, audible books. Uh, my wife uh, turned me on to a few years ago, just the Libby library app where I can, I don't have to buy them anymore. So I can just check them out and listen to an audio book or, or a regular book. I'm more of an audio book uh, guy for the most part, just from a timing standpoint. But yeah, I'm I am too. too. Yep. Yeah. But, Boy, I tell you what, you, you and me, um, if we'd had podcasts when we were younger, I think we'd have conquered the world. I mean, um, I, I'm kind of like you. I, you know, I remember, you know, I mean, now, how old are you? Um, I'll be 45 in a few weeks. OK, so I'm 57 and a half. Um, so, you know, there definitely wasn't anything like that. You know, when I was growing up or going through college, I mean, I got out of college and five years, 1986, in, with a graphic advertising design degree and had never even turned on a computer. You know, I mean, that's how <laughs> that's how out of the realm I was. But I do remember one of my first jobs that it was a I worked at a silk screening plant. And I was, you know, silk screening signs and stuff. And we were allowed to have radios at our at our little silk screening stations. And I remember that, uh, I mean, and this had to be like, uh, 1987, probably. I remember if you if you turn the dial on the radio just right, I could get Oprah Winfrey's TV show to come on my radio, oh, and I wow. thought and I thought that was so cool that I could spend an hour listening to Oprah interviewing people. So I had this love of podcasts before there, you know, it was even even fathomable. But instead of listening to music. 
I chose to try to get Oprah's show to come in on my radio so I could, and I love the episodes where she talked to business owners or entrepreneurs or people that had built these empires. And so I thought that was so cool. So, you know, I've always had this desire, you know, I think kind of like you of, of learning and listening and, and like you say, garbage in, garbage out. And so rather than spending my time, you know, listening to a lot of music, um, you know, reading books and like you, I do not have time. Uh, yep. to sit down and read books, but I do uh, listen to a lot of audio books uh, and now it's just podcasts. And so people are like, how long do you walk in the morning? And I'm like 90 <laughs> minutes, 90 minutes every morning. And, and they're like, why? And I'm like, Hey, it's 90 minutes of podcasts. I get in, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, you're getting the exercise, you're getting fresh air, you're getting sunshine. Classroom then, time. Exactly. You're getting classroom yeah. time. So, yeah, no, and yeah. I'm the, I, I've found that uh, what I, the best books for me now, I, I feel like, um, and they're, they all have their own things, but a lot of the leadership books now, I feel like I've read or listened to enough of those that they, they're, they, they all have the same uh, similar theme. Now, the books that I really like to listen to are uh, auto, autobiographies. Uh, Elon Musk's book, I, I, I love. Uh, Phil uh, Knight, the Shoe Dog book is great. Um, Steve Jobs' book. And, and you hear the struggle. And, and that's what, for me, that's what, we, we all have it. I think sometimes we just feel like we're alone a little bit. And, and so hearing some of these guys that have built these mega businesses, uh, I, I, I get a lot more from that than I do leadership stuff. Now, not to say that I, I'm a great, I, I think I'm an okay leader, but I, I got a long ways to go without a doubt. But, the, but just hearing some of the struggle and some of the things that they, they went through and uh, that, that's what I really get into now. But, yeah, I, I'm, I agree. I'm, I'm kind of like you. And, and even with my podcast that I listen to, um, I listened for, you know, probably straight a good two years of kind of the same ones. And then they kind of all started sounding the same and it was the same subjects, just a different voice. And and so now I like the and and so now I kind of enjoy the interviews where it's kind of talking to somebody and then drawing out of them. Like you say, the struggles they had, you know, where did they feel like they were entrepreneurs when they were young? Because my whole point of my podcast and my blog is I think everybody's got a business or a blog or a podcast or a video channel or something with inside of them that they can teach other people. You know, I, I just think, and then the, once you start doing that, I think there's opportunities to make money. So I, I think everybody could, can eventually quit their nine to five job that they're not happy with. Now, if you're at a nine to five job and you're happy with it, you know, man, more power to you. Keep doing that. But for the people that don't feel like they're fulfilled or they want to have a little more freedom or, you know, that I like to, you know, get, you know, like talking to you today, maybe there's something that you're going to say that could spark somebody that's working at another business and, and, and they, they could, could say, say to themselves, themselves oh, wow, well, you know, if he did it, maybe, maybe I can do it, you know. And, Absolutely. If, if I can, anybody can. And Curtis, and I've mentioned it on my podcast, but I wouldn't have a podcast had I not been listening to yours, listening to your podcast, recommending the Anchor app, and then just just go do it. And up up and before that, I was trying to do a YouTube channel, and I still have it, and I, I've scaled it back a little bit. I just found that I wasn't I wasn't completely happy with the quality of it, and and then it was really taking a lot of time for me to edit it, and and still not be completely in love with the quality. So I've scaled that back, but I also the timing was perfect for your podcast. You're like, Hey, try it for three months. So I, I was kind of at that three month time frame, And then you were talking about starting a podcast and I was like, wait a second, what do I have? I have a couple hours of drive time. I, I might be able to do some of this in driving or, I, and I love podcasts. So you inspired me. And then because of that, uh, there's been, I know of, uh, there's one guy that works for me here at the shop that started a podcast. And then there's another, uh, another guy that I had interviewed that started a podcast and, and there may be, I think there's one or two more that are kind of working on it, figuring it out. So uh, your, your, your network is growing Curtis of all the people that you've influenced. Oh, well, I appreciate that. That is so cool. So, so, so let's talk about your podcast. Um, kind of tell everybody kind of what your idea where it was kind of what some of your episodes are. And then just kind of real quick, I mean, tell people how easy it was to get started. I mean, tell them what background you had in doing a podcast before you started. <laughs> oh, uh, zero. Listening to them for, uh, really was it just, uh, and the same, like you said, I, I love the interview part of it. 
Uh, for me, what I really w have been trying to document as much as possible is the uh, transition in the shop. What I what what I, my YouTube channel started with was showing uh, the shop in how I started it, uh, what we purchased, what, what my wife and I purchased and what it looked like. So I had a full tour of the shop and then I was doing an interview. Um, I was interviewing myself, I guess in some of the transition and some of the things that we were doing. So the initial idea was to really document this transition from uh, working at a shop for 10 years, a uh, one shop for 10 years to buying my first shop. And um, the way that we operate is a little different than traditional shops. Uh, so I wanted to sh show that uh, we work on a team pay system, which is really different from most automotive. Uh, there's a few automotive uh, service departments and body shops, a, a handful around the country, but not very many operate in that. So wanted to document all of that. And so it started with YouTube, and then I just kind of felt that that was getting a little stale. So then listening to your podcast, I just downloaded the app and started recording. And then it started with really um, – just just that my weekly struggles and then I got into um, a little bit of my history and how I kind of got into the business and just even some random stories uh, of whatever and just just kind of going with it and then as it's evolved as I've continually like like you say kept going then you and I had a conversation too about you you stopped by the shop one day and, and we had a conversation about interviewing um, successful people and, and, or just business owners or entrepreneurs. And, and so from that, I was like, well, yeah, I know a lot of these people from different areas, a lot of automotive, obviously, but other industries and whatever else that have excelled at whatever. So as again, a, after you and I talked and really kind of processing that, I thought I changed it. I shifted the name to Midwest success stories so then the idea now is once a week I interview someone that's successful, but it doesn't mean rich. It doesn't mean it, it really means whatever it means to that person. Uh, it can mean anything, but get their story, get, let, give them an opportunity to talk about their story. Who doesn't love sharing with other people about their story or how they've overcome things or whatever they've gone through. And so started with that. And then I, then once a week or at least once a week and maybe another time a week, then I will um, also go into the shop. So kind of writing, I hope, I guess, I believe to be writing my own uh, Midwest success story here in Enid, Oklahoma, uh, as we've bought the shop and, and moving through uh, really getting things dialed in here. And then, um, and then my interview uh, weekly interviews that I do, uh, that I try to release every Friday, try, working very hard to be very consistent with that. And then uh, sometimes, man, it's just a random thought. I had a, uh, the other, so one thing I've, I'm trying to figure out is just a unique question to ask everyone that I talk to. And the question right now is, what's something that most people don't know about you? But I don't, what I've realized is I'm not giving anybody any sort of forewarning or an opportunity to kind of prepare for that. Because the first time I was asked that question, I was like, oh man, that's so cool. What can I think? What is it? What is it? What is it? I can't think it. You know, just like uh, 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 the pressure of that. And then like a day later, the same day, I was like, oh, I should have said this. Or, <laughs> so, so the difference now is I'm going to try to give someone an opportunity to prepare for that question a little bit. So like my episode on Sunday was just that. Hey, wait a second. I'm asking people to tell something that most people don't know about them. So I, that's what Sunday was just a random, Hey, here's something that most people don't know about me or depending on when we knew each other in, in my life, you might know this or not. And so I'll probably throw some of those random things in there every once in a while. But for the most part, it's an interview with someone in the Midwest or some connection to the Midwest. That's got a success story like Curtis Tucker, that buzz guy. And then there's also uh, my success story in process and who knows other random stuff that just pops into my head from time to time. Yeah, that's so cool because that, I think that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, talk about, I'm going to try to teach people things that pop into my head, uh, but then interview people. But then like uh, yesterday, 
or I, it was e either yesterday or the day before I was out for my afternoon walk, which kind of gives me a lot of ideas, uh, writing a book and, and podcast episodes. And for some reason, something popped into my head and said, the truths of getting older. And mm. I was, and I was like, well, I need to write that. And so all the, for, through my 45 minute walk, I kept, I'd stop every now and then because I thought I would think of something and it'd be like, well, this is the truth of getting older. And this is, <laughs> you know, and so, so I'm kind of right in that perfect age where I'm 57. So I've lived, you know, I've lived longer than I've got left. So I'm over the halfway <laughs> point, you know, unless I make it to 114, but I'm not so old that, you know, I'm kind of disconnected from, you know, the younger people. So I think it's a good, so that'll be one of my podcast and blog episodes is these, it may end up being a dozen truths of getting older. And I, and again, it just popped into my head, but I thought, well, you know, if I was 20 years old and, and ran across this, these would be some kind of cool things that you might want to know to start planning for, because, you know, it's things I'm looking at like, wow, I didn't think about this 30 years ago. I didn't think about this 20 years ago. And, and so, um, Absolutely. That's awesome. yeah, so, so, yeah. So anyway, so that's going to be fun, I think just, uh, and then again, you know, listening to other podcasts, sometimes I get a little boring because I get a little repetitious. Um, I kind of like the, I, I think I've read where one of the, like the number one podcasting genre is, is crime, but up oh, there yeah. is, is personal journals. Uh, uh, people really like personal journals and kind of what other people are up to. And so I think you and I mixing our own personal journals and thoughts with information, I hopefully will be a good combo and, and maybe get our podcast out there a little bit more. So, well, yeah. Uh, and that's the thing I, I, for me is I I'm really, there's certain things that I'll kind of delay a little bit, depending on what I've got going on with a hire or, or a, a contract or an agreement or something, but man, there's some dumb stuff that I've done that I'm not proud of. And I, and I'm putting it out there. I, I, I am who I am and I'm, I'm flawed. And so I feel like that helps people to connect to, wow, this guy, this knucklehead <laughs> has his own business. <laughs> so that's what, for me, I, I love just kind of being, being, being real. Hey, I, I, I screw up often. Yeah, well, that's my exact story. I mean, when I'm asked to, to talk to like entrepreneurial seminars and things like that, I mean, I've got one of the kookiest stories because I, I dumped everything into the Google basket and got killed, you know, in 2012. And, and it was a huge mistake and pretty much had to restart everything that I was doing in 2013. So, you know, I'm the same way. And I, I like to throw it out there because, you know, people, people got to know that it's not I, you know, I think we see, it's kind of like a singer. We see these singers and all of a sudden they're on the radio everywhere and they're, they're rich and famous. And we think, wow, you know, overnight sensation, but we don't know that they've been singing for 20 years and they were singing in nightclubs for 15 of those years, not making, you know, 200 bucks a week and, you know, and, and sleeping in sleazy motels and, you know, and, and so, you know, it's kind of cool us, you know, telling people that, you know, everything we've done isn't, wasn't right and didn't make us money or get us, you know, a step further. It, it, sometimes it set us back a little bit, you know, and I think people need to know that they need to know that there are struggles in being an entrepreneur and owning your own business. And it's not all, you know, uh, roses, but, you know, the rewards uh, by far outweigh, you know, any of the negatives that I, I've run into so far. So, Absolutely. And, and as you uh, eloquent, eloquently say very often, you got to get started. You yeah, man. You got to get started you, getting you, something out there, whatever it is, you got to get started. Yeah. And like you, you, you got a YouTube channel started and, and then you kind of decided, hey, that's not exactly the way I wanted to go. And, and so, and I started this podcast, uh, that buzz guy thinking, you know, I'm going to kind of talk about these little technical and, and, you know, things like that to get people started. And then I started thinking, well, no, that's getting a little boring. And I think people are going to get bored of that. So I need to maybe get a little more creative and maybe journal a little, little bit more. And then, I, then because of you, I was like, okay, I'm going to break down. And I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and do the uh, interview thing and interview people, but I don't want to interview. I don't want to be like all the other podcasts where, you know, somebody famous releases a book and then they're on all 10 of the most popular social media podcasts, you know, I don't want to be the 11th guy interviewing the same person. Uh, yep. So, so I'm like you, I think, I think making, keeping it local and uh, interviewing people that other people haven't never heard from is kind of a good idea and kind of cool and, and get it, keep everything fresh and, and new ideas and, 
and things like that. So, so, so from you, what I want to do, cause I, I've kind of heard um, that you kind of run your shop a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if this is going to be strictly auto body shop related, but kind of tell us what you do as far as being a business leader, a boss, what does your shop do that, that does make you different than other auto body shops? And then how do you, what are some of the cool things that maybe you do customer service wise that might set you above the other auto body shops or even let's say an intern agency or, or whatever, you know, what, what are, are some of the things that you're doing that kind of set you apart as a business? Awesome. Well, you, you, you gotta be careful. I don't know how long this podcast goes because I, now, now we're like deep into my passion. Um, honestly, the, the main thing for us is just a team, a team atmosphere. So uh, what, what I want, what I really want is that everybody within our organization is working together to serve our guests as better than anyone. And so anybody that walks through our door, I, I want it to be a positive experience. And that, so maybe they're just lost and they're asking for directions. Hey, whatever we've got to do to take, to let's Google the address or however we can help this person so that it's a positive experience. For the most part, most people that come to a body shop it's a negative experience. Something bad happened. They backed into something. They, somebody ran into them, whatever. It's a, it's a bad experience. So we, we want it to be a positive. Uh, one of the things I'm really proud of at this shop is our communication. What happens that I've seen at a lot of shops, especially just automotive for whatever reason, um, we, have, we may have someone's car and we're making progress on it, but we're not doing a good job at keeping that person communicated with. So we have text message updates. Uh, our system, our management system does automated ones. And then we also follow up with a phone call just so that no matter what, I, it, it kind of makes me ill when if, I, if, a, if a guest feels like they haven't been kept informed. They don't know what's going on with the car. They want to know. And we have stuff that happens that goes wrong regularly. Uh, parts didn't come in as we thought. Or we, a couple of weeks ago, our air compressor was down for a while. And, and so we have these things that come up. But the worst part about that is if you were expecting to get your car done this Friday and you haven't heard anything. And then on Friday, I'm telling you all the bad, all the stuff that happened. Well, you, you kind of doubt us at that point. What, well, why didn't you tell me on Tuesday you didn't get the parts? So we, we've just made sure that that's a focus that, that, Hey, we, we, people know that things happen at their jobs. We're just going to be very clear that w where we're at, Hey, parts are supposed to be here th on Tuesday and we're planning to have your car done on Friday. We'll call you again in a couple of days. And then if it do, things don't come in, then you know that as it progresses. And if we need to revise that, we can revise it. We, we don't want you to be uh, surprised that you don't get your car. If for some reason we run into a delay, we yeah. really do a nice job at meeting our expectations. But yeah, no one wants those. Don't, don't know what's going on. Well, let, let me give you a quick example that, you, you know, about the same time that you messaged me after my car accident, and, you know, I, I don't want to be, you know, I hate to be negative. I just want to tell you my, so what you just said is so fantastic because what happened with me is I took my vehicle to a auto body shop, just, you know, what are, what are the odds? Um, and, and I left it there and I said, okay. And at that point we didn't know that the vehicle had been totaled. We, we thought it was going to be repaired. And I asked the, the company, I said, how, about how long is this going to take? And they said, well, it'll take about two weeks. And so I thought, cool. So I literally did not bug them. I did not call them. I did not do anything for two weeks. I never heard from them one time in two weeks. So the two weeks was like on a Friday and I waited till the weekend and called them the next Monday. So we were two weeks and a couple of days and I called them on that next Monday and I said, Hey, uh, just calling to check on my car thinking in my mind, because I'm in a rental, um, yep. You know, and all this, I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to get my car today. I should have probably got it Friday, but they didn't call. That's cool. I waited. I got I'm patient. Called them on that Monday and they said, uh, well, here, let us you need to talk to this guy. So I talked to that guy and he said, oh, yeah, we've about got all the parts. And then once we get approval from the uh, guy's insurance company, we'll start on it. And wow. I said and I literally almost dropped the phone. I said, what do you mean start on it? I said, you're telling me you haven't even started on it? No, no. I said, I said, but you said it would be two weeks. Well, it'll be two weeks when we start on it. 
And I was like, well, that, you know, that's not, you know, I didn't feel like that's what I was told. And so I just, I mean, I just, I got a little testy. I mean, I didn't scream or yell or, yeah. you know, I, but I was, I was upset. I was like, I cannot believe this. I mean, yeah. I called thinking my vehicle was going to be done today. And now I'm finding out that now the process is my, I said, I said, what do I need to do today to get you to start working on my vehicle today? And he was like, well, I, I, I think, think we're going to start on your vehicle no matter what today. Then I was like, and then at that point, I'm like, now I've got two more weeks to wait. And I was just, I was so frustrated. So yeah. listening to what you're saying, uh, keeping the customer informed. And, and, and I know I dropped the ball on that, like with my web clients, you know, I might get a little busy and, and I know that, hey, I might have told this client that, you know, I'm going to get my their web design, or at least the first proof on this date. And I missed that date. And, and then I, you know, I, I should, like you, I need to call them and say, hey, or email, at least send them a message and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit behind. But more than that is great that, uh, that you guys do that. So uh, you probably do some other things. Go ahead and uh, continue on yeah. with what you guys do there. Yeah. So uh, then, then the next thing is uh, we're very, just really um, focused. So where a lot of shops, the delays happen is, again, kind of like what you're describing. It, it's most shops around the country struggle with these same things. So the, the process is, for the most part, the insurance, we need to get the okay from the insurance company. And it could be whatever that initial amount is, is really kind of arbitrary because today's cars, they have so many uh, things on them uh, from technology, uh, sonar crews, park, uh, park sensors, um, just cameras everywhere just all these they're very very technologically advanced now and there's a ton of plastic parts and pieces and brackets and stuff so what may look like a simple um a simple damage very often has something behind there hidden behind there they're even though they seem like they crumple up and they do crumple up way more than they did back in the 50s and 60s they're actually way safer because they're supposed to crumple up and they're supposed to keep you safe but what that means is there's a lot of hidden damage. So what we do, every car that comes in, we walk around it with our guests to check it in to see what's part of this claim or accident and then what's not. Because um, I wrecked my mom's car in high school all down the passenger side, and I didn't tell her. She didn't know about it. And then three months later, she'd come out and look at the passenger side and said, what, I, what happened? I must have got hit in the parking lot. And you know, me, I just kind of nod and shook my head. <laughs> yep, I guess so. You know, so people don't walk around their car often and look at it the way that they do when they pick it up from the shop. So we, we check it in with them um, and then we pre-wash every car. So especially in Oklahoma, man, cars are filthy and all the rain and stuff that we've had lately. So we pre-wash it before we start working on it, make sure it's clean. And then we have a team that all they do is disassemble cars all day long. So they just disassemble them and identify all the damage. Anything and everything that needs to come off of that car for the repairs, we, we take it off. Because there's a lot of – because it's a lot of plastic and kind of like Legos in some senses, some of these things snap on once, and then you try to take them off, and they break. So anything that we're going to need to fix that car, we're going to take it off, and then we're going to identify it if it needs replaced. And, and we're going to put that we have our uh, each car has a cart. So we have every cart organized, the bottom shelf of replacement items and the upper two shelves are stuff that we're reusing or new parts. And so we, we go through that and then we have an estimator in the shop that all he does is identify damage with this technician that's disassembling it. And, and so they're not distracted by they, they have distractions, of course, but they don't have as many some of the just surprise distractions with someone walking in the door or the phone ringing or whatever. So they can focus on that. After that, then that, that fold, the car goes, we, we wait until we get the authorization. So we'll send off a supplement to the insurance company. We're going to let the, the guests know at that point that, hey, we, here's everything that we found. Uh, we're getting the authorization. Uh, we, you know, depending on the insurance company, we typically kind of know how they're going to handle things. Uh, and then we order the parts. Uh, another thing that's really unique to Enid Auto Body is we only use original equipment manufacturer parts. So a lot of insurance companies, they're going to quote aftermarket parts or imitation parts. Um, and we don't, um, we, we offer, we only use original equipment parts. So if you, your Jeep, we're only going to put Jeep parts on. 
but the insur- your insurance company might say, hey, we want to f- we want to buy this generic fender for it. Well, if that fender is available, then we'll price match that. In some cases, that could mean that we lose money on it. But we have found that it's faster. It's a faster, better repair for our guests to go with all OEM parts, original equipment manufacturer parts. So so we order the parts. And while the parts are on their way, then we're also getting the authorizations from the insurance companies. Once we have all the parts and we have everything OK, then it goes to our body department and our body technician um, does the panel replacement or panel repair. Then it goes to the paint shop and then it goes to reassembly. Each one of those cells is a individual that that that's that's what they do. So this assembly is one one role and one cell body is one one role and one cell. Paint is one roll in one cell and then reassembly. So the person that puts the car together is not necessarily the same person that took it apart. So we have a really cool uh, system, organization system for the fasteners and the retainers and everything to be able to do that. And that keeps us going. And then the, the next really cool thing for me from a leadership standpoint is it's they're all compensated as a team. So my tech, a lot of body shops and, and mechanic shops operate on a commission basis. So the technician that's working on the car may only get paid if the book time, the uh, labor manual or whatever says to um, change this fender out, it pays 2.4 hours. Well, if that technician can get that done in 1.5 hours, well, he kind of wins, right? He's, he's, he made an extra nine tenths. Or if it took him three hours, he lost six tenths in that. So that's how most technicians get paid, but they get paid as individuals. So from a management and leadership standpoint, the the hard part is you kind of have one building, but you may have six different shops in essence because they act almost as independent contractors. For me, the team pay model, then it, it, it takes all this experience that we have and they work together to get cars done. So they, they only get paid for cars completed and they get paid for cars completed as a group. So then sometimes that means that those guys may flex out of those roles. If we've got a bottleneck right now, like right now, we have a little bit of a bottleneck in our paint shop. So we have a reassembly guy helping in the paint shop to help keep the paint shop going. And that just helps everyone's compensated for getting those cars done. So a lot, a few, quite a few things. Uh, the, the, the main thing is kind of our process. It's a lean manufacturing uh, type of, of, production process that we utilize that not very many shops are as disciplined as we are at it uh only oem parts and then and then our team pay uh our our three big things but what our guests see the most important part is they know what's going on with the car at all times and when we say it's going to be done we rarely miss that date very cool yeah and and you gave me a tour of your facility and it was really cool i'd never seen anything like that. I mean, you have this push cart with all the parts that were taken off and everything's marked. And I mean, it was really good. And then you have, like you say, you had these stations and uh, kind of very, very cool. So, I mean, um, and that's kind of what I'm looking for in these interviews is, is what's making your business, you know, these people's businesses stand out from others. So as far as like maybe marketing or advertising, I know you get a lot, a lot of your business just through insurance companies. Is there anything you guys do for insurance companies or, or marketing or advertising wise just to get your name out there a little different than anybody else? Um, you can have some uh, relationships with them that help. Uh, a lot of times that's how, that's how the world works a little bit for us. They had, uh, we have one, we have two uh, insurance companies that we work with. Uh, what we've really worked on now, when I came into town is I went to the insurance agents uh, to their office and just introduced myself, dropped off some business cards, uh, just kind of saying hi, showing some of the things that we're doing, and then and then now talking to them. As we when we first started, we were doing about ninety percent all o- OEM parts, and then now we've made the commitment that hey, even if we lose money, we're going to go OEM. So now that's one of the things that I do, and then just uh, well, uh, listening to this to your podcast and learning um, just the different things to be doing some tagging and getting some stuff out there. And then there's another shop uh, that I follow that used to be a competitor from Wichita 
and just seeing all the things that they're doing and putting out there. So trying to get some good content out on Facebook. I've been running some Facebook ads, doing some Google advertising, uh, just little stuff that I kind of know. And then as soon as I hear something on your podcast, man, I'm, I'm trying to put it into to my mix. But uh, the main thing is I, tr- just I believe that most insurance companies are dri- it's cost for insurance companies. So and, and one a big expense is rental car. So if, if we can, by being organized and consistent, if we can get our cars out faster, then they're more inclined to send some work our way because it's going to save them money at, at 30 or 40 bucks a day on a rental car. Uh, that, that's pretty hard to argue how much that could save them. Like using your, uh, your old Buzzmobile as an example. With two weeks, and they still hadn't started, and then it was going to be another two weeks, man, that we, we could have easily, we would likely trimmed off the other two weeks. The, the first two weeks. Yeah, that now, now somewhere in that second two weeks, they totaled the car. And so I didn't yeah. have to wait two weeks, but I did get the, uh, I did get to see the car rental bill and it was over $800. So, yep. um, so yeah, I'm sure insurance companies would appreciate uh, any money that could be saved there. So that's yep. uh, very cool. Okay. Uh, I was trying to think, it seems like I had another question for you. Um, before we, I was going to wrap this up with you, um, 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 but I can't think of it. So, um, oh, advertising wise. Um, so yeah, so, uh, the perfect thing about this interview is I'm going to be able to take this interview and that's what I'm going to write my article about your auto body shop on Nina buzz. And then we'll uh, have an article for you. So you are using one of my companies, my media company, Enid Buzz, and we're going to get a story out there about you and how you've come to Enid, Oklahoma and purchased a existing company, changed the name, made improvements. And uh, then we're going to do some Facebook, uh, Enid Buzz Facebook advertising for you on there as well. So, um, you know, I highly, highly recommend and believe in social media as far as people out there with uh, brick and mortar businesses um, advertising their businesses because you, it, the reach is just, you know, for the cost uh, right now is just ridiculous. You know, you get so much more for your money. So um, yep. I will get that set up for you now that I have all of your information, all these cool things that you guys do uh, above and beyond what maybe some of the other companies do. And I'll get awesome. that on there. So Thank any you. closing, any closing thoughts um, from you as far as any, any other entrepreneurial things that maybe we haven't talked about? Man, I, I just I just appreciate you, Curtis. Um, just see it, your your positive energy, uh, the things that you're doing, your photos, your podcast has been very helpful for me, getting me going. And then as I've reached out and and we've gotten to know each other, just uh, getting to know you and and uh, you, you've helped me so much, and and I appreciate it. And I just want to thank you for that. And I'm really kind of honored and humbled to to be on here with you. I, it means a lot to me, and I and I I. I'm thankful for that. And then I also look forward to how, how we get to know each other even more just to, as, as things continue. Well, yeah, well, you are officially the, that buzz guys first official guest on the podcast. So I uh, can't wait to get this all thrown together. Hopefully I will get it on the air either Tuesday or Wednesday. And, uh, and then, yeah, you and I just need to reconnect and have lunch or something and, um, and we'll just kind of go from there. But again, uh, thank you for being on the show, Ken. I greatly appreciate it. I will have your stuff done for Ian and Buzz here pretty quick as well. And, uh, and everybody out there, please go to, uh, I'm sure uh, you're on Apple Podcasts. You can go to Anchor and uh, listen to Ken's podcast. And um, are, you, are you still doing anything on the YouTube channel? Yeah, once a month. I just did. Uh, I just had an old Buick. We called it my dream machine, uh, and, and she had another name, a beige Betty. Uh, that was the five hundred dollar car I bought last summer uh, to get us here to make this happen as we were tightening up our funds. So I just had a farewell uh, video to beige Betty. So about oh, cool. once a month, about once a month, I'm doing a YouTube video and then uh, then doing the podcast a couple times a week. So okay. Midwest Success Stories with Ken Hunnell is the name of the podcast. And yeah, it's on iTunes, Spotify, all that. Okay, great. I appreciate you, Ken. We will talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Curtis.